I'd like to greet everyone. My name is Balash Horvat. I, am, I work together with Andre in Bratislava in the UNDP's regional center um, in the poverty reduction practice. In my talk, I will be focusing primarily on the economic and macroeconomic, in particular macroeconomic aspect. Some of the things that I'll be saying comes from joint work with Ben Slay, so I wanted to acknowledge that before I start. And let me just give you an outline of what I will be talking about. Um, don't worry, not all of this. The second one is a separate one, which we might do after the, after the lunch break. So today, it will be only the first four point. I will be talking about the global crisis, which is an economic crisis, a financial crisis, and has several other angles, and I'll, I'll be a little bit more specific on that as we, as we come to that stage. I'll give you a few background figures which complement those that you have seen from Andre's presentation. And then I'll give you my, my take on, on how one could visualize what, what we are faced with. What is this crisis that we face? And, and I, I, I put this on the table because I believe that this is a good way of visualizing it because from it follows a way to formulate the policy response, which in my mind is, is the most important because we can, we can sort of get upset about all the bad things that are happening, but what we need to focus on is what we can change and what we can change are policies, so it's important to think about those right. Um, and, and that's basically the second half of this presentation. First, uh, sort of big picture view of how you would want to go about formulating the policy response, and then I'll give you a couple of examples, and, and they're sort of fairly elaborated. Some of them are fairly elaborated, and others are less so. And, and this is basically what I'll talk about this morning. And in the afternoon, if we get to it, and, and if there is a wish, then I can talk a little bit about international financial uh, institutions, uh, in particular IMF and World Bank, and, and how they relate to each other and, and all the other sort of big zoo of international organizations that you can see out in the world. But right now, let's focus on the crisis. Uh, first, this might be useful to look at. This is regional GDP growth trends in the world, so how various regions are faring. And, and what you see is that the highest growth rate was in Asia and in CIS. Um, we, we talked a little bit in the previous lecture about the growth rates, how developing countries and emerging economies were growing faster than developed countries, that's basically just another way of saying there is convergence in the world, that the countries with lower income are actually catching up with countries with higher income just because they're driving a little bit more slowly than, than the emerging markets which are driving faster, so they're converging. Now, this is wonderful news, right? And this has been the case for quite some time, but there is risk which dri with driving at a very high speed. And that risk is very clearly shown for CIS, Southeastern Europe, and new member states, um, and also for Latin America. What you see is that the 2009 projected growth rate is very negative for CIS, almost as negative for the Southeastern European countries and new member states, and somewhat less so, but still negative for Latin America. Uh, the rest of the world, at, at least at the time when, when this projection was made, was expected to cruise along at a lower, slower speed. Um, this is projection. Now, let's look at actuals. This is the first quarter of 2009 compared with first quarter of 2008. So it's a uh, an annualized, it's not annualized, but it's a growth rate that, that more or less gets rid of the seasonal aspects. And, and what you see is a very sad story. What you see is that in the first quarter, Ukraine's output, as measured by GDP, dropped by a fifth compared to the same quarter in a, a year ago. And, and then you get the Baltics up there, Turkey in mixed in between, and, and Russia, Slovakia, Mongo, actually that's Slovenia, um, and so on. Actually, I've just come back from Armenia. The number is minus six for Armenia, 
that's, that's why the yellow highlight there. Actually, for the first five months, compared to the first five months of the previous year, the number is minus 14. So things are getting worse. So first picture was about projections for the year as a whole. Second picture is about actual outcomes as measured by statistics. So we do have a crisis. That's, that's the point. Now, there is one critical channel of transmission of this crisis, and that's the trade channel. This also has come up in, in, in the previous lecture when Andre has talked and, and during the questions. Uh, for essentially the, the smaller CIS countries, what really matters is, is in terms of export, uh, what matters is the Russian market and the European market. And what you can see here is they were actually doing very well. Both those markets were growing. Actually, the Russian market was growing at a tremendous rate. When I say market, it's import demand, actually. Uh, this is Russia's CIS imports, these numbers, going at a, an annual rate of 38 43%. This is phenomenal, which, mean, which meant that the Russian market was pulling in phenomenal amounts of exports from the other CIS countries. And then look what happened. 2008, fourth quarter, already a 13% drop. 2009, first quarter, 45% drop. There was a similar turnaround in terms of uh, demand for exports from the European uh, countries. This is EU27. This is the entire European Union. Uh, it is somewhat smaller of, of a drop than Russia, but those are incredibly big numbers. A 15% drop year on year in the first quarter is, is a very bad thing. So this was what Andrei has referred to as, as the end of export-driven growth. I would slightly rephrase it. I don't think export-driven growth as a concept should be thrown out. It's going through bad times right now. There is no demand for exports. But it, there will be demand returning at some point, and, and the concept should not be thrown out. Okay, so what, do, what does the crisis imply? There's quite a lot to scratch our heads about. Uh, there's clearly a break in growth. Uh, there's clearly a recession in the picture for most countries in the region. And when I say region, I mean Eastern Europe and South, Southern Europe and the former Soviet Union. Uh, there are clearly worsening trends in terms of inequality uh, human development indicators, especially uh, the various dimensions of poverty. So I, not, I mean not only income poverty, but, but the, the other angles as well. Um, access to health care and education is clearly undermined just because the budget is also suffering. Social strains are on the rise. Um, all in all, one could say that the incredibly positive picture that we have seen in terms of human development indicators in the first seven eight years of the 2000s, uh, that is likely to, much of that progress is likely to be lost. Uh, a whole lot depends, how much you would, you would ask, and that's the obvious question, much depends on, on the reaction on policies. There is no question about it that there will be a backsliding, and how big that is and how sustained it is will depend on how policymakers react. And of course, on a number of exogenous uh, factors as well, which we can discuss if you like. Uh, the point I would like to make, the final point on this, is that when you look at the individual indicators, there are very strong feedback loops. Once poverty increases, then there will be coping mechanisms that people set in motion. They can't buy the coal to heat their homes, so they'll go and cut the woods, uh, cut the trees because they have to heat their homes. If they cut the trees, the, environment, the is degra environmental degradation starts, which then feeds back to poverty. And then poverty also means uh, that uh, poverty and an income loss in general means that, that health and education, access to those will, will drop. Actually, income loss will mean that. But once that happens, that feeds back to poverty. And, and similarly, conflicts can flare up. Uh, there, there is a very significant supply of frozen conflicts in our region, and, and those have a tendency to flare up when, when times are tougher. So, so these kinds of feedback loops are 
important to keep in mind. Now, here is my way of conceptualizing the crisis. It's layer upon layer upon layer. I, I put this to you not because I want to sort of uh, put a cheap joke that, you know, if you look at the crisis this way, as you peel away the individual layers, tears come to your eyes. I, I promise there will be something deeper than this in, in what I have to say. But I do think this is a powerful way of looking at it. So now let's do this in words. What we have is an interdependent, globalized world where we are facing not one shock, not two, but several. Actually, you can group those shocks into short-term and long-term. The short-term shocks are, first, a standard cyclical downturn. There is nothing extraordinary about cyclical downturns. They are ingrained in the nature of a market economy. And this time around, it, it has been bigger than usual. And that had to do with the buildup of massive global imbalances. You have seen a chart earlier about current account imbalances. Of course, the current account for the world in principle is zero. So if there is a bunch of countries that is running very big deficits, there must be a bunch of countries that run surpluses because it evens out in the world. And that's what Paul Krugman referred to as the fact that we don't have another planet to export to. Um, so we have a cyclical downturn. We also have a financial crisis. And that's very obvious. The financial system is in crisis. The unusual feature of this crisis is that before, most financial crises have originated at the periphery in developing countries. Think about the debt crisis originating in Latin America. Think about the Russia crisis that originated in Russia. This time around, it came smack in from the middle of the developed countries, from the most developed financial market in the world, the US. And it sort of hit the entire system from an un unexpected angle. And, and it has been big. Um, the third short-term or high-frequency shock that I would like to point to is the unprecedented roller coaster of commodity prices. Think about oil. Oil traded at $20 a barrel um, seven, eight years ago. It reached $147 per barrel. Uh, some t sometime around the first half of 2008, fell back to 40 something, and now it's between 60 and 70, depending on which day you pick to look at these things. Uh, this is an unprecedented up and down in, in prices. And this was just an example. Take any other price, take steel prices. Steel prices in Ju third week of July 2008 were at their peak. From that peak, steel prices, at least in the composition of steel products that Ukraine exports, uh, have dropped by almost 60%, so to a level which is less than half, in a matter of four and a half months. This is a tremendous shock to any economy which relies a lot on commodity exports, or, for that matter, relies a lot on importing certain commodities whose price just goes through the roof. So this roller coaster of commodity prices, of course, it's in part related to the cyclical position of the world economy, but it has had to do with some other aspects as well. So I've, re I've listed three short-term uh, shocks that every country has to deal with. Now let's look at long-term shocks. And here the point I'd like to make is that these long-term shocks, while, have, while they have an impact which is out, 5, 10, even 20, 25 years from now. But if we are to do something about it in terms of policy response, those policy, whatever the best minds in the world have come up with so far in terms of policy response, that had a lag of approximately equal length. So if you want to do something about demographic, one of the shocks, demographic issues, you'd better begin now because it will take you 5, 10, 20 years to actually have an impact to counterbalance the shock that you foresee at a horizon of 20, 25 years. So let's look at these longer term shocks. First, extreme income inequality. I think uh, in our region especially, but throughout the world, what we have been witnessing is that the rich have been getting richer and the poor have been getting at least relatively poorer. Uh, there, 
the, the way people measure this is usually the Gini coefficient. Gini coefficients are showing a phenomenal rise in income inequality. Uh, there are many other ways to measure this. Uh, in practically every country, with the exception of China and India, you have seen, well, actually within country, even in China and India, you have seen a tremendous increase in inequality. There has, at the same time, been very substantial progress made in terms of poverty and income, even, even towards income e e equality in, at the level of the world. But essentially, all of that came from some countries' income having gone up very, very rapidly. China, India are, are the prime example. Within countries, income inequality has increased in practically every country. And in some, it, has, did, it did not increase, like in some Scandinavian countries. And those were the ones that had done best. Income inequality is one long-term shock. I, I view this as a long-term shock because it takes decades for this to unfold. And I, let me tell you, it will take decades to push back. Demographic shifts I already talked about. What I mean here is the change in the composition of the population. And it has tremendous consequences. If you have the share of working age population to the population who need to be supported, which is the children and the elderly, if that share shifts a lot, then you either gain or lose a lot. And, and what we see, at least in many uh, Eastern European countries and in several of the CIS countries uh, that this shift is ongoing. It is tremendous in some countries. Uh, again, let me give you an example of Ukraine. Ukraine had an overall population of 50 million just a few years ago. It's 46 million now and it's projected to be 35 million in 20 years. Within that, the share of the elderly will be increasing very substantially. Now, you could say, no problem, let's just export and import some people. But this is happening for Ukraine simultaneously with Russia and Belarus, Poland. Those are the natural places where they could easily exchange people. So instead of a natural equalizer, instead they are facing a huge problem because at the same time when Ukraine is, is facing the crunch, Russia, Belarus, Poland will be also facing the crunch. So not, let alone sort of sending people to Ukraine, they will actually be looking for, for people to, to have enough workers to sustain the level of pensions and health care that is needed. And then I'd like to point to climate change. That's an even longer term issue. But very, very clearly, if you want to do something about climate change in 2050, 60, 70, you'd better begin now. Because it's a slow process both to build up the, the greenhouse gases, but also to, to slow the build-up down and to actually reverse it. So short-term, long-term issues, all of those require action now. That's the onion, OK? Very many different layers. And you will have to act on them now. The short-term, just by nature, because this is short-term. The longer-term, because whatever action you can dream up will take time to bring, bring fruit. So, now that I've given you a fairly pessimistic picture, what do we do about this? Well, my proposal is to take a look at the individual layers and see what the doctor has ordered. Very smart economists over decades have built up a body of knowledge on what to do with each of these individual layers of the onion, each of these challenges. So when it comes to a cyclical downturn, John Maynard Keynes tells us you have to actually implement policies that support demand because that will address the cyclical downturn. Now, what happens when there is a financial crisis? Again, there are smart economists who have come up with ways to address financial crises. And the idea here is that what you want to do is to maintain the system. You, you don't want to allow the financial system to collapse. That's not to say that you don't want to let banks go under. They should go under, because if they've overextended themselves, they should. But that there are certain banks which are too large to fail. Those need to be bailed out, because if any one of these single huge banks goes under, it just drags the whole system down with it. And financial system is basically the plumbing 
of the entire economy. If you don't have credit, if you don't have the financial resources going to where they need to go, if you don't have a redistribution of people's savings to where it needs to go to, for investment, then the entire economy will function at a much, much lower rate of efficiency. So you need to want to keep the financial system at low. What to do about commodity prices going, jumping up and down? Well, in fact, the consensus in the economic profession is that you really want to let the market do its job because there is no way that you can find the right level of prices in general. But you certainly have to address in instances of market failure or instances where certain aspects which have nothing to do with the functioning of the market had a very important uh, impact on prices. For example, the Iraq war had an impact on oil prices. Uh, you would want to avoid some of those wars, and, and that can help. Sure. Let me come to that. I have a whole slide on that. Actually, you'll have, you hear about that more than you ever wanted to hear because <laughs> it's one of my hobby horses. So yes, definitely, I'll come to that. If you allow me to come to that at a later Sorry. point. Now, coming to policy responses for the longer term issues that I have mentioned. Uh, in terms of inequality, you want to address it by fiscal redistribution which is just to say you tax people and then use some of that for social support. You want to enhance inclusive markets, and, and I can talk about that a little. There, there are several people in our practice who are working on this, and, and that is basically a market-friendly approach of, of, sustain, of supporting small and medium enterprises that can generate income by generating employment for the poorer parts of population. So this is not about supporting the investment bankers, rather it is supporting the poor women in rural areas and so on. Uh, if that happens, then through market mechanisms, you can actually support income generation and therefore lower income inequality. When it comes to demographics, you have to do pension reform, health reform, and immigration reform. Uh, it's an interesting fact that most people think about demographic, uh, demographic problems as, as primarily causing problems in the pension system, and th that is certainly true, but actually the overall cost is bigger in terms of healthcare than in terms of the pension system. When, when, when economists did serious research about this, this is what they found. What you need to take away from this is that it actually health is actually as big a problem in terms of demographic shifts than, than, uh, than pension. And then immigration certainly has to be part of the solution. Um, and then we come to what you do about global warming. And the idea here is that as long as the price of energy does not reflect two things. One is that it's primarily from sources that are non-renewable. And the price has to reflect that. And also, as you generate energy, you are imposing a cost on others. When you drive your big SUV, you're not just you know, using the gasoline for yourself. You are also imposing pollution on others. And you're contributing to global warming. This needs to be priced in. And as long as this pricing in does not happen, whatever you hear from all kinds of people saying, hey, let's do something about global warming. That's just hot air. Sorry for the pun. It's really the moment you want to get serious, you want to talk about pricing. And, and I still have some more to say about this, but this was just a preview. OK, so we had problems, short term, long term. We have individual layers of solutions for each of these. Now, it will not come as a major surprise for you that what I suggest is the optimal policy response should be some kind of mix of the various, various uh, medicines that are suggested for the various ailments. And, and here comes the art. You actually have to combine the elements, as many of the elements of addressing individual layers of this onion as possible. 
But of course, this brings up a whole host of questions. One question, of course, will be trade-offs. There will be some things which will be politically very popular, and there will be others which will be deeply unpopular. There will be things that are economically feasible easily, and there are others which are not. There will be an, there will be an environmental angle on, on what you do. So these trade-offs will have to be carefully laid out, and some kind of balance needs to be struck in all these dimensions. There is also compatibility issues. And just a very simple example, compatibility issues can take the form of a, a limited amount of resources available. You would want to address inequality by handing out a lot of money to the poor people, but hey, you also want to address global climate change and, and perhaps support technologies that, that lower, lower the, the intensity of greenhouse gas emission, but you also want to have major public works programs because that will generate employment and that will address the cyclical aspect of, of this uh, conundrum of, of issues. But you will definitely not have money for all of these. So this is a trade-off and it's also an issue of, of where you strike the balance and some of them may not be even compatible. You may want to support, for example, some industries, but then they may actually increase pollution. So you have to figure out which is how, how they are compatible. And then, of course, there are sequencing issues. Um, this is not enough. In addition to all this, so we have the layers of the onion, the various remedies, and then the recipe that you want to take as many of these various remedies together in a compatible and consistent manner. In addition, the government will also have to deliver on its other roles. And what I mean here is it has to be stronger and more effective in terms of regulating monopolies and regulating the, and supervising the financial system. This is one area where the crisis has shown government has fallen short. When I say government here, I mean governments and central banks together. They have clearly fallen short in terms of regulating and supervising the financial system and also monopolies. And this is something that needs to be addressed. There is also a need to improve the governance and transparency of government, governance of public uh, policy making and governance of implementing public policies and also the transparency of government actions. And we can discuss that. One natural reaction appears to be that if, if we're in trouble, let's just close our country, let's not import anything from others, and let's, let's make sure we can export as much as we can to the other countries. Now, this might be optimal from, might appear optimal from a single country perspective. We just aggregate this over the world. If everyone tries to do this in every single country, what you end up with is a huge problem. And the world has run this experiment, and the result has been the Great Depression. We don't want to go that way. So the point here is you, you want to avoid self-defeating protectionist uh, policy, trade policies. And finally, I'd like to mention a very important aspect, and that is the legal empowerment of the poor. Uh, Hernando de Soto, for example, argues that if you are serious about addressing poverty, you really have to give the poor people enforceable property rights. And this is a neat theory. But the guy actually went out and did this in Mexico slums. Actually, in Mexico slums, the problem was that everyone had a little uh, cardboard or something made house. And it was a horrible place to live because the sewerage was not resolved. There, was, there were no trees, no grass, nothing. Because no one had an incentive to invest in anything public. And that was because they knew that next day, police could come and confiscate their cardboards and there would go their houses. So why the hell invest in all these things? Hernando de Soto went to Mexico, went to Mexico City, to one of the slums, and talked to everyone, not him, but to his whole team, and said, you now have a clear piece of paper and the government signed on. This is your stuff. And this is enforceable property rights. Which means you can sell it, you can, your children can inherit it. And now, let's see what you want to do in terms of the public services. And lo and behold, a lot of good things have happened. It 
has become greener, sewerage has been resolved without necessarily any major public investment, just because enforceable property rights have been implemented. This was an experiment. It is seen as a very powerful, positive experiment with positive results. And, and this is the basis for my saying that legal empowerment of the poor is an important thing. Access to law is another aspect of this. There has been a very nice UNDP uh, piece, actually, on this, uh, done together by Hernando de Soto and uh, Madeleine Albright, uh, which you may want to look up. OK. So I've talked to you a lot about general theory, right? So where is the beef? How, how, would you, how would one actually go about this? Let me give you, I think, four examples altogether. Example one, if you're serious about addressing all these things, you have to have a sound basis for public spending. And for this, you need to widen the tax base. This is a key test of governance and social cohesion. OK, what do I mean by widening the tax base? What I mean by that is oligarchs must also pay their taxes. Everyone must pay their taxes. And then, and only then, will the budget have sufficient resources to cover the necessary needs to provide quality public services. This is only a necessary condition. It's not a uh, sufficient condition. The government can be lousy. It can be inefficient. It can still squander all the money. But without a more equitable distribution of the tax burden, it will not go anywhere. Widening the tax base is critical, therefore. Again, I can give you examples from Ukraine. I can give you examples from Armenia. I'm sure you can give examples from your own country. There is a very inequitable distribution of the tax burden. This has to do with oligarchs. This has to do with the informal economy. This has to do with short-term incentives. It has to do with inefficient tax administration from the side of the government. But all these things together, and it has to do with corruption. So you mix all these elements together, what you get is the outcome that we have now, which is that the tax burden is very unequally uh, shouldered and certainly does not generate enough resources to provide quality public services. Um, I've mentioned all the in, in ingredients that go into this tax administration, uh, making tax evasion clo uh, costly. But there is a very stark choice. You either do this or you will have essential public services going unfunded in the current crisis episode. And, and that is going to be a very bad thing. Um, there is also a need to support regional and global efforts to avoid tax evasion. Because if you only clamp down in one country, what you will see is your guys just go somewhere else and, and take their wealth and take their income, income generation. And, and that's not going to work. So this has to be a, a global effort. Um, another thing where, where I think these layers of the onion come in very, very clearly, you hear that for practically all countries, the, the, the recommendation of the IMF, of the World Bank, and, and essentially all macroeconomists is that you have to have a fiscal stimulus. Now that there is insufficient demand, the government has to step in. And, and as a short-run prescription, this is not a bad idea. I actually agree with it. If there is enough fiscal space, yes, go for it. But the composition of that fiscal stimulus is critical. And in that composition, address the other issues that have been mentioned. And what I mean is, yes, by all means, bolster overall demand, domestic demand. But do it by creating green jobs, supporting low-carbon technologies, you also want to just look at the overall tax benefit system to ensure that, that social inequality can be rolled back. In a context where you have budgetary, the budgetary envelope shrinking, this is the crisis, so revenues will shrink. At the same time, you have needs growing. There's no way around it. Part of the answer has to be better targeting of social support. And in the region, there are countries with phenomenally badly targeted social support. Uh, Serbia. Serbia and Croatia has 
something called support for war veterans. They eat up a tremendous amount of the budget. And they're really just payments to cronies who have been close. I, I'm sure there are, there are other, other sort of worthy uh, transfers included in this, but it's phenomenally inefficient. And it's, very, it's several percentage points of GDP. This is one obvious example that you would want to target when, when you actually go about enhancing the targeting of your social transfers. Uh, and again, coming back to demographic changes, when you do the fiscal stimulus, part of it should go towards revamping the health system. Part of it, and it need not be a whole lot, should go into enhancing immigration system and, and putting in place immigration and pension reforms. Okay, let's go on with the examples. Um, this is an obvious one. No one really talks about it much. But here is an economist talking to you. The economist will always ask the same question. Here I have one dollar. I can use it for anything. Where should I use it? What, for what objective? And the economist will tell you, use it where the result is biggest. If this is what drives you, then it's, it's a no-brainer. What you want to do is use your scarce, or at least part of your scarce resources, to resolve regional and ethnic conflicts. Conflicts are incredibly costly in terms of lost income, in terms of lost human capital, in terms of poverty increases. Uh, there are obvious examples. You can, you can, I'm sure, add to these. Moldova, the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, Kosovo versus Serbia, and then the whole set of problems in Bosnia, Herzegovina. Uh, similar issues regarding the Roma. And, and again, let me just state, if you are guided by this economist principle that I have limited amount of resources and I want to make the most out of it, this is an obvious example of where you would want to invest some resources in a crisis. The, the immediate res response you get when you talk to budget people, they say, you're out of your mind. We have a crisis. You're coming up with it now? And I, says, I say, no, I'm not out of my mind. I'm coming up with it now because now is the time when if you don't do anything about these crises, they will flare up just because the pressures are now increasing. So you have to do something. And this is an area where you would want to invest more. Now we come to your question. Um, there's a need for coordinated action for climate change. It's involved, all this stuff up there, and I'll go through it. Uh, what I'd like to ask you to remember, this is a global problem. It's a global issue. So the solution has to be global as well. So the first point I've already made, energy pricing must internalize two things that we are dealing mostly with non-renewable resources. And second, there are externalities imposed on others, negative externalities, when one generates electricity, when one drives a car and therefore uses uh, fossil fuels, and so on. Right now, the incentives of final users are totally misaligned. Right now, energy prices tell you that gasoline costs about as much as, as it costs to extract it from the ground. Those prices do not tell you that there are externalities. In Europe, they tell you more than in the US. And in Iran, they don't tell it to you at all because prices are so low there. Um, and, and in Europe, they tell you a little bit because taxes are high. You pay more for gasoline in Europe, much more than elsewhere. Um, but as long as there is no uniformly high level of energy prices that internalizes all this. When you buy a liter of gasoline, you actually pay a fairly high amount because that will account for the fact that you are irretrievably using up a resource that has taken 300 million years to produce. And as you do so, you're actually making life a little bit more miserable for everybody else, actually for yourself as well. 
because you're emitting pollution. And at least pay for it. Because price is the most important signal that people actually do respond to. Another reason why you want to raise the price of, of energy is that right now, the low prices of energy place potential pe people with plans to, to invest in, renew in renewable energy research. It places them at a huge disadvantage. Why the hell bother if I can get energy at, you know, three years ago in the US, less than a dollar for a gallon? It just prices out a lot of the technology from the market that would deliver alternatives. Again, this is a kind of signal that is just set at a very inefficient, very bad level, at an incorrect level. Um, so if you don't do this, all the rest is hot air. You can preach as much as you like about, well, protect the planet, and, and please do everything to help to make sure that in 2050, the level of greenhouse gases will not be so bad, nobody will listen to you. They will listen to you, they will say, yeah, you're right, and then they go back and do their thing. The thing to get them is through the price. So that was the first and, and most important point that I, I, I'd like to make about this. Now, there are, of course, very serious issues with this. How exactly do you go about this? There are always losers and winners in, in any relative price change. This is a relative price change I'm advocating. So there will be the oil companies which will be unhappy because they will be selling less oil. And there will be consumers who will be unhappy because they say, hey, now it costs me more, so I have less money for the rest of my consumption basket. There will be social planners who will shout at you you're out of your mind. You're supposed to be in the poverty practice, poverty reduction practice, and you're preaching something that actually directly leads to an increase in poverty. So there is this issue of winners and losers and, and what you do about it. Well, what you do about it is compensate the losers and stimulate the winners. And I'll come to the resource, uh, to where the resources come from this in a moment. Uh, there's an unrelated but equally important thing. Right now, whoever extracts oil from the ground, of course, expends some costs on actually physically getting the stuff out of the ground. But because he or she can sell it for much, much more than the actual production costs, there's a realization of rent. This rent comes from the fact that it's coming out of the ground. You don't actually have to produce it. Now, who captures this rent is the subject of enormous fight right now in the world. You, no, nobody much speaks about this, but actually if Saudi Arabia raises the price of crude oil, well, then they capture the rent. If instead crude oil prices are relatively low and there are taxes imposed in the user countries, well, guess who gets those taxes? taxes? It's the treasuries of the developed countries. So they capture the rent. The rent is there. The, gains from being able to take something out of the ground which is valuable is there. But there's a huge issue of who gets it. And there's a need to address this issue. There's a need for some way of distributing the rent between the countries that actually produce the oil and the countries that use it. This is tremendously hard. But remember what I said. We are facing a global issue. And if we don't face up to it, our kids will live in a country, in a, on a planet which, which has much worse conditions for living. Uh, there is also, still in terms of problems, there is the free rider issue. And that is that if only one or several countries do it, some others may keep energy prices low and then have a competitive position which is, which is better than the rest of them. So this is this free rider issue also has to be addressed. And then the enforcement. Uh, how, it, how actually do you make sure that the price is high in all countries? Uh, 
And uh, the question here is whether countries can act in a global interest. And uh, if you had sort of very optimistic views about this, just consider where we are right now. Countries are not acting in the global interest. If you go in any European countries and fill up your car, half of the time you're filling it with taxes. And then only the other half is the actual cost of the gasoline, including the cost of the crude oil and the refining costs and the transportation costs and everything else. So as a factual matter, right now, Saudi Arabia is sharing the rent with every country that imposes a tax on the final consumption of gasoline. Now, you would ask, why the hell do they do this? Why don't they raise the, level, the, the price of crude to a level that, that actually would capture the rent all for themselves? And the answer to that is that it would require a cartel, and they tried. Remember OPEC? Uh, the cartel was not stable. The, the cartel could not sustain the level of prices at the level that they capture all the rent. It's just that it, it, it wasn't a Nash equilibrium in a game theoretic sense. That as everyone else was keeping the crude price at that level, it was optimal for one single country to say, hey, I can sell it for five bucks less. And then that country would actually gain a lot more market share at the expense of all the rest. So they were not able to sustain it. What you have is an equilibrium that the exporting countries capture some of the rent and the importing countries capture some of the rent. Equally, as you said, that the exporting countries' interest to capture all the rent. Actually, the importing countries also want to capture all the rent, right? That, that's, that's, that would be their interest, but they cannot. So right now, they are sharing it at some level. Nobody talks about this much, but they are. And it's huge amount of, of financial resources. Oil is the single most traded commodity. It is a very big chunk of total exports and imports. And the taxes on, on crude are very substantial. Export taxes on the exporter's side. Russia has an export tax. Saudi Arabia has just a single monopoly, so they don't need to bother. But they, they also raise the crude to a certain crude price to a certain level. But there is a, a sharing of these rents right now. It has to do with market structure. It has to do with this dynamic equilibrium of cartels. But yes, the, as a first, in the first instance, yes, of course, everyone wants to capture 100% of the rent for themselves. But how it evolves ends up with this sharing. Let me come to this. How, given this inevitable need and the equally inevitable large number of problems. How could one go about raising the energy price? Well, there would have to be coordinated increases in taxes on greenhouse gas emission, coordinated in the sense that it would result in an equal price for energy across all countries. You can't do this like this. You obviously have to implement this overnight, but uh, implement, not implement this overnight, but implement it gradually. Um, it's a very tall order. But what we face is a situation we either do this or the market will do it for us. We just go on for five, six, ten years more on the path that Andre's charts have shown. And then we reach prices of, of crude oil of $500 a barrel because there will not be enough of the stuff, and because at the low price, demand has gone through the roof. At that point, the price of energy will have reached the level where the adjustment begins. So our option is not that we can forever avoid raising the price of energy. What I'm suggesting is doing it in a more orderly way and doing it earlier. And as a result, global climate change could be addressed more efficiently. If we don't, we as governments, all the governments in the, in the world, we, do, we choose not to address it. And we can have any number of excuses for it. We can say, oh, these other guys are not talking to us. I really want to do the right thing. But because they don't do it, I don't do anything either. Well, then the market will do it. 
It will do it later, and it will do it in a grossly disorderly fashion, and it's going to hurt. Okay, so coordinated hike in taxes is the way to go. Now, if you hike taxes, you have more fiscal revenue, right? Now, what I am suggesting is not to hike taxes and stop there. Just tax everybody. Instead, this is a sin tax. It's a tax that is supposed to change behavior. But the revenue that is generated by it should be used for these other objectives that we should have. It should be used to reduce inequality. It should be used to alleviate poverty. It should be used to subsidize technologies that are, that are friendly to the environment. It should be used to prop up employment. And if you ask uh, an economist, it's, it's relatively simple to do something about employment. Just lower the insane levels at which you are taxing formal employment right now social contributions, health contributions, unemployment contributions, payroll taxes, all together add up to a phenomenal burden on formal employment. And this is one big reason, actually, by the way, uh, for having a big informal sector in, in most of our countries. So use some of the additional revenues that you get from, from taxing energy and energy use to reducing some taxes, which are the most distorting ones. And as a byproduct, you actually do something for the environment, give the right signals for, for the final users of energy, and at the same time, you actually raise employment. Believe it or not, there, there is quite a bit of thought that went into this. It can work, but even if there is a wonderfully smart single government, it will not work, because this has to be done in a coordinated fashion across the globe. And then, in due course, you actually do have to keep some of the additional revenue because of fiscal sustainability. Right now, the stimulus packages are, are raising the budget deficit to a level that is not sustainable. What do I mean by that? A deficit has to be financed. How do you finance it? You run up debt. Debt has that service costs. It, you actually pay interest in addition to having to return the principal. As you run deficit year after year after year, every year just adds a block to your debt stock and it increases your interest costs. So some of the additional revenues will probably have to be saved. It cannot be redistributed in full. But there is the good news also. If you actually do this, then the structure of demand changes, and there will be significant savings on energy use. And those savings include savings of budgetary institutions for energy use. So over a dynamic path, you actually may not have to save that much from it. Maybe some of the savings will, will help you out. All right. So I, I guess uh, from what I have said, it, it may be clear, but I believe that crisis is an opportunity for reform. Uh, most people don't think about it that way. Most people say, oh gee, crisis, what the hell do we do now? It's horrible. But actually, if you look empirically at past major reform efforts, most of them have come at about the time of crisis. And, and when I, I First, I had this saying, at the time of crisis, but it's actually at about the time of crisis. Smart governments foresee that there is big trouble coming, so they actually act perhaps even before the crisis hits. Really stupid governments just ignore it, and then they act after the crisis hits, and then governments in between may act as they see that the crisis is unfolding and they begin to act. Uh, this is an, more or less an empirical fact. Now, why is it that if there is a crisis and there is a clear realization by everybody that there is a crisis, even if it hasn't fully run its course yet, why is it that you can actually do reforms? That has to do with vested interests that have been deeply entrenched before. They are weakened. They can no longer so easily do the thing that they have done in previously. Oligarchs may not be so easily able 
to avoid paying any taxes. Also, there, in, in political science, you are blocking coalitions. That's, that's how, how things are derailed. Blocking coalitions are basically coalitions of, of special interests that, that come together and act to, to block certain changes. In the stress of a crisis, these coalitions uh, generally turn more unstable because the interests diverge and because they cannot uh, afford not looking for their short-term profits. Um, and, and as a result, blocking coalitions are less powerful. There's also the desire of society. As, as everybody sees that trouble is brewing and gee, even my nephew lost his job and, and I have less income, everybody realizes something really needs to be done. And, and you should really not underestimate this kind of realization. And finally, in a crisis, it becomes crystal clear that, of course, you can argue that you want to not do anything. But the long-term costs of that are looming much more clearly. Growing poverty, uh, human capital loss, rising crime, triggering conflicts, all these things become sort of more realistic risks and dangers when you are in a crisis. And uh, the final thought is that as a crisis unfolds, people may not have a choice other than just leave where they are, pull up the stakes, and just move to an economically, economically more well-off region. And economic migration can actually be a very disruptive thing, both for the countries from which the migrants leave and also for the countries which suddenly are faced with a tidal wave of, of people from poor regions. And, and of course, it's not only across countries, but also within countries. Certain regions get depopulated, cities get just swollen, and, and that causes a whole set of problems. And therefore, it actually becomes clear for policymakers as well that in the time of a crisis, you really want to act. Um, that concludes my talk here. I would open for questions if you have any. Thank you. So just a quick question. You said that smart governments actually foresee you know, uh, the crisis and stupid governments act post factum, basically. Do you have any examples of smart governments in the world? Yes. Yes, I certainly do. Uh, and it, uh, it has to do, in, in our region, I would say, there are various governments which have done a number of things quite well. Uh, let me start with an unusual example, and that is Russia. Russia actually has looked at oil prices being high, and instead of spending it all, they actually built up a big fund, a national wealth fund. That is something that the Russian government has done very, very wisely. It reflected their looking ahead, and it has helped them a lot in, in the first stages of the crisis. I am not arguing that the Russian government has done everything right. I am emphatically arguing that this was a very smart thing from the Russian government to do. Um, Czech government avoided running up external debt. It has run very good policies, not only in terms of general macroeconomic policies, but also it has been much smarter in regulating the financial sector than others. So that's a good example in my book. Unfortunately, I have to put my own country, Hungary, in the other group. Uh, macroeconomic policies were decidedly um, unsustainable and uh, silly. Um, and also, the regulation of the financial sector has not been even as good as, as the average of other countries. Uh, my particular point on the financial sector is that in Hungary, the borrowing in foreign currency has been allowed to, build, to be built up to such levels that, that, uh, that is really an outlier among most countries. 
And, and as a result, we now are faced with a situation that bus drivers uh, are indebted in Swiss francs. They have never even seen a Swiss franc, never been to Switzerland, and never ever will have Swiss franc income. Yet, they are indebted in Swiss francs, just because the banks found it optimal to do it that way, and supervision has not stepped in in time. So there are examples for policies that are smart and forward-looking. There are examples of policies which are the opposite. And most governments have done a fair share of both, but some have a mixture which is closer to a positive overall, and others have a mixture which is a negative overall. I just wanted to talk a little bit more about your point about uh, political and fiscal efforts for resolving some regional or ethnic conflicts or tensions, potentially. Mm -hmm. um, so we talked about, on the one hand, improving the distribution of tax and like improving the targeting mechanism so that uh, support reaches the poor, among which minorities of whatever kind are usually overly represented. And on the other hand, that goes into the face of this decreasing social solidarity that we talked about. So people from mainstream society that also have their living standards decrease, say, you know, how come more support goes towards minorities of whatever kind? So mm -hmm. what is practical? What are the practical ways of dealing with that? And if you can mention some specific... Um, mm -hmm examples from your work. Okay. So let me try on the conflict side. Actually, I, I, I gave a somewhat similar speech in, in Armenia and, and, and a former minister came up to me and said, you're out of your mind. You say fiscal resources used for conflict resolution, you mean paying off those guys who, who are shooting at us. And I said, no, absolutely not. What I have in mind is invest some fiscal resources in confidence building measures, invest some fiscal resources in going to border areas where they have common issues across the border, sewerage system, water supply, energy supply, and try to address those. It will generally not need a whole lot of resources, but it does wonders. And actually, it restores what has already been in place in the past. Very often in a, in a border area, the nearest power station is actually in the other country. And it, because of the tremendous losses of associated with transporting electricity, it makes a lot of economic sense to actually import that electricity to that border area. Um, in the European Union, you now have a spot market that goes across all the countries. And, and it's a much more efficient system. And, what I have in mind, of course, again, not that overnight you can get to that level, but there are glaringly obvious examples where there are artificial thresholds that are not being crossed right now because of conflict. That if they were, those thresholds were lowered, a whole lot of economic efficiency gains could be, could be made. And efficiency gains just mean that you have additional income that you can distribute. So the idea is identify bottlenecks that are particularly associated with the conflict and then demolish those bottlenecks. And that will have some resource need from the budget. And this is what I have in mind, that use you know, some of your fiscal stimulus for addressing conflicts. But they can actually unleash a whole amount of, of new income down the road. So they're incredibly efficient. And this is what I mean by having the biggest bank for the buck. Okay. Very interesting presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. Uh, my question uh, relates to the demographic uh, mm -hmm. and migration-related issues. Yeah. Um, as we see, the recent uh, demographic uh, policy of uh, the Russian Federation is tend to be a big headache for Kyrgyzstan. Uh, Kyrgyzstan's economy and the human development perspective in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, because it uh, creates an opportunity for Kyrgyz uh, labor migrants uh, to get naturalized uh, uh, in this country in the future. Yeah. And because there is a simplified procedures and rules, 
of course there is a certain policy and mm -hmm. certain interest of the uh, of the Russian Federation but uh, you when you are talking about the um, uh, addressing such issues uh, we should uh, always uh, uh, have to in mind the uh, coordinated approach yes. I mean, regional approach mm -hmm. and uh, clearly we don't see this picture here and uh, my question is like uh, in your opinion how we should I mean how the uh, maybe in the free within the framework of Eurasia how these countries should address uh, this issue in mm -hmm. the long pers term perspective mm -hmm. you're pointing to something which is very important actually you are completely right that there are externalities across countries what is one country's gain is possibly another quite probably another country's loss and uh, you also pointed to the right solution which is a coordinated way of addressing this but there is no way around it employable high quality uh, employable people with high quality education are a scarce resource and what you see now is a scramble for this scarce resource you know people are scrambling for oil uh, places of, 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 of where they find oil or coal human resources are just as important and what you see is a fight for those and uh, the economist in me tells me that there's no way around it the price of this resource will be bid up so unless Kyrgyzstan is able to pay them at a higher rate they will lose them uh, it is very clear that there is a need for a coordinated approach and actually Russia should have some, some um, reasons to hold back from just openly grabbing all the people they can because there are other dimensions of relationships between countries and even small countries can hit back in their own way so the optimal solution is, is not to deny that there is a scarcity of this resource and not to deny that there is actually some, some competition for it but then try to allocate this resource in a way that doesn't un completely undercut each country now I might be wrong but population growth is positive in Kyrgyzstan right? The yes. is, uh, going it's up. different uh, yes so there is a natural situation where both can gain from this right so okay this is a scarce resource which is valuable somehow Russia has to pay for it and if they do and, and, and this is I, I guess my suggestion some way needs to be found that Kyrgyzstan is, is compensated for, for this resource now there is one and I'll come to this there is one very natural way of compensating for it and that's trans. Uh, um, sending money back you know all these people who work in Russia the remittances so in a way it's already happening but Russia could be asked to compensate for the costs of educating those people in Kyrgyzstan which is a very normal and, and rational request and if some way can be found for this then this could be a mutually advantageous trade especially taking into account the additional remittances that are generated um, you can sense that I don't have a ready-made solution for everything obviously but these would be elements of, of how I would go about it okay. you don't think that we have an opposite effect in the sense that the, the company manager for instance and the business environment will be will, will be a, a contrary effect on that because they don't want to <laughs> to pay much more tax than and when there is the crisis uh, of course it's much more uh, difficult to pay taxes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this is pretty much a zero-sum game between the taxpayer and the in the short run taxpayer and 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 the budget you know I I'm the budget you are the the company manager I take away your money and you don't, don't like it pay. of course they don't have money to pay well the yes yes I understand so here is what I tell you two things one if you've been paying your taxes you don't need to pay any more if you haven't paid any 
Uh, sorry, you do have to, because you are benefiting from a number of public services, right? You know, you can value an army as, as, as most people do, or as I do, at almost zero, but still, an army is being provided. Police protection is being provided. Po fire protection is being, pro yeah, yeah, so public goods are being provided. Therefore, my argument is not raising the tax rates, which is what you seem to imply. My argument is, if you have been paying taxes so far, you're fine. You should not pay more. And in fact, you should pay less because the crisis lowers your income. Tax rate is, is flat, but not the amount of the tax. If you have lower income, you will actually pay less. But if you haven't been paying taxes so far, sorry, I'm going after you. Yes. So that is the idea of widening the base, including those who have not been in there before. It's not raising the rate. The single tax rate that I'm proposing to raise is on energy for reasons that I have explained. No other tax rate. I, I actually propose to lower some tax rates. If you're a company manager, you would be delighted to hear that what I would suggest is to lower the payroll tax, because I want you to employ more people. OK? All right, well, I've exhausted everybody. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Second part is a very partial introduction to some aspects of international financial institutions. And that Andre's request came from the fact that I, because of my previous life, I, I had uh, some insights in the workings of uh, one international financial institution, in particular the International Monetary Fund. Uh, what I'll do is, is give you a, a very quick layout of the landscape, and then talk a little bit about significant problems that I see in governance of these institutions. And this is what I mean by the democracy of quotas, and believe me, I'll, I'll explain. And then conclude that the IMF and the World Bank and, and all the regional banks, uh, they are a somewhat flawed but definitely necessary part of the global response to the kinds of challenges that the financial system and, and, and developing countries face. Uh, but they are flawed, and they need to be improved. And, and some parts of the flaws I will talk about. OK. The Bretton Woods institutions and regional and specialized banks. These are the economic uh, parts of the zoo I have referred to before. Uh, the, the various uh, banks and funds and, and uh, institutions in the financial sector that aim to address short-term and long-term problems of the international financial system. Uh, first, let's talk about the Bretton Woods sisters. Bretton Woods is a little town in New Hampshire where after the end of the Second World War, all the leading economists of the world have come in together and there they have founded two international financial institutions, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, which then subsequently grew into something called the World Bank Group because it has IBRD, International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, but also IFC, which is the private sector component of the World Bank Group, and also MIGA, which is the investment guarantee uh, outfit, and uh, several other parts. But at the time, it was somewhat simpler. In 1946, they had the IMF and the World of, and IBRD. The idea was that the IMF would be basically a gigantic credit union where every country would pay in a certain amount. That would result in a pile of cash, and that pile of cash could be used on a rotating basis to help out countries which are facing short-term balance of payments problem. What this means is if a country cannot pay its external payments coming due, then it comes to the IMF. And in a short-term loan, 
gets the necessary resources to pay so the international financial system is not undermined and at the same time the country would have some time to adjust to the problems that it faces. Because this is a gigantic credit union, the fund is using the money of not, not its own money but the money of all its member countries and to be able to ensure that that money is not lost so that it's repaid over time so it can be again used somewhere else the IMF imposes conditions and the conditions are basically saying you do the right thing in terms of macroeconomic policies and then you can get the money. That's basically, that was the original idea and this is how it continues to function. The original idea at that point was actually that the IMF has to protect the, fixed in, the system of fixed interest rate, fixed exchange rates because in 1946 all the exchange rates were fixed to the dollar ultimately and the dollar was fixed to the gold price. One ounce of gold was worth $35. Anyone sh showed up with an ounce of gold at any point in any American bank was entitled to get $35 or vice versa. Showed up with 35 bucks was entitled to get an ounce of gold. And that system worked beautifully for a long, long time. But in 1971 it blew up. The fund actually had to find a new reason for its existence and that's when the emphasis has moved on to policy design and the short-term balance of payment support aspect remained. The World Bank is a development institution. It looks more at sectoral issues. It looks at development issues in, more in developing countries. Actually, the World Bank is mostly active in developing countries only, um, and, and I'll talk about the IMF, which, which, uh, which actually has activities in, in other countries as well. The, the bottom line to remember from this is that the IMF is short term, the World Bank is more long term in its lending and its focus. Also, the IMF are the macro guys and the World Bank are the micro guys. Macroeconomists versus microeconomists. And not only economists, actually the World Bank has more employees who are not economists than economists. Um, and if economists are not even the largest group of, of specialists in the World Bank. Um, also, there is this... Uh, there is this distinguishing that is done between transition public and private sector. Where am I? Uh, public private sector here. That, as I said, IFC in the World Bank Group actually does business only with the private sector. It takes equity positions in private sector institutions and then sells them on and thereby facilitates development in, in, in various countries. At the same time, IDA lending uh, in the World Bank is done only with the public sector and IMF lending is actually done with very, very few exceptions only with the central banks of countries. And the very few exceptions are Turkey where there has been some IMF money going, that, ha that has gone to directly to budget and uh, and actually somewhere else I just heard I forget which country but in any case uh, actually I think it's Armenia or I don't know where but primarily the rule is IMF lends short term for balance of payments purposes to the central bank World Bank lends in its uh, low cost uh, arm, the IDA, lends to public sector for long term, 30, 40 years, at actually at the subsidized interest rates. Um, so this is the distinction. Um, what should really strike you from this is that, hey, every country has macro and micro. Every country has public and private sector. So while both these institutions have over the decades built up a substantial bureaucracy. That bureaucracy is actually reasonably comp competent, but they are parallel. There, there is, other than historical sort of uh, path dependence, there is not really a very good reason why these should be separate. 
why there should not be a single institution that actually looks at both the macro and the micro, the sectoral and, and, and the broad policy. Now, in addition to these two, the Bretton Woods sisters, uh, there is also a, a, a whole set of regional or specialized banks. EBRD is one. EBRD has actually been set up fairly recently at the time when the transition process has begun. It was aimed at providing financial support to the transition uh, process. EBRD is primarily aimed at private sector, but it does have public sector projects. It is project-based, so it's more a micro-institution than, than a macro-institution. Uh, and it has done quite a lot of, of uh, good work in, in, uh, in uh, transition economies of Europe and the former Soviet Union. ADB, Asian Development Bank, similarly uh, a regional bank, also mostly project-based. EIB, European Investment Bank, is, is a bank of the European Union, and uh, it really focuses on large investment projects that, that are done in European Union member countries, mostly. It does envisage some activities outside the EU too, but primarily within the EU. Um, what has happened is that now you have the big Bretton Woods sisters, which have a very clear sort of division of labor, plus these regional banks and the specialized banks. I haven't mentioned African Development Bank. I haven't mentioned uh, <coughs> Inter-American inter Bank and, and a bunch of others. Um, what we have is the, the specialized or regional banks have either, either a regional niche or a sector niche. Um, they have a clear distinction between who does public sector, who does private sector, and they have a big fight amongst each other in dividing the limited development uh, sort of uh, arena. And, and what has emerged is that there is an agreement among them that there are areas in which the IMF takes the lead. If it's an issue of exchange rate policy, if it's an issue of formulating fiscal or monetary policy in a country, then the IMF takes the lead. If it's an issue that has to do with which sectors need to be developed or large dams uh, that have to be or that are argued as needed, uh, then this is clearly the World Bank. Um, if it's a EU member country and it's a major investment project like, like a huge power station, EIB will come in. If it's uh, the transition economies of Europe or former uh, or CIS, let's put it this way, then EBRD is a major player. EBRD is actually the biggest investor in a number of our countries. So each have carved out their role. They by and large play positive roles. They, are, they each have lead positions in something which they are guarding jealously. And you should see some of these memos going back and forth. You should not have talked about this because this is my area. Um, still, it's, it has been functioning reasonably well. Um, now, there are significant problems, and I'll come to that in a moment. Those problems have to do some with historical past dependence on, on how things have evolved in the past, others with governance issues, and, and this I will spend some more time on. Um, and, and third, that other than being jealous of each other, they haven't really done much of an effort to work together. There is, in particular, limited interaction of, of the Bretton Woods sisters with UN agencies, which actually would be a very very sensible thing to do. And I'll, I'll give a little bit of detail on that too. And then we come to the governance structure. Um, the first thing to note is that the, now I'm talking about the Bretton Woods sisters again. They have distinctly different ways of financing themselves. The World Bank is a AAA borrower, which means it just goes out and borrows the money that it needs to, to lend. And it, it borrows at a very low rate. It has the same uh, credit uh, rating as the US government. 
so it can borrow very cheaply. And it does, and it manages the, its finances very well. Um, so this is the source of funds for the World Bank. As I said, the IMF is a gigantic credit union. The source of funds is what are, what are called quotas. Every country is determined a quota. That, is, that determines the amount of money it has to pay in to the IMF, and that money paid in is the, the resource that is being lent out. Um, now, the quotas are also the quantities that determine the voting power. It is not the case that in the IMF you have every country having a single vote, which is the UN way of doing things. Um, instead, every SDR in, okay, every unit of quota gives you one share. So if you have a bigger quota, you have more, more voting power. That's the democracy of quotas. So I'll, I'll show you some, some fairly interesting implications of this way of defining democracy. In, in a, this is actually the, the corporate definition. It's, it's like owning shares. If you own more shares, you have more votes. And, and if you own a, a controlling packet of shares, then you determine the fate of the company. And very similarly in the IMF, if you have a bigger quota, you actually have a bigger vote. And uh, from there on, everything is done very democratically. All the decisions have to be done either with 51% of the quotas represented as yes, or 85% of the quota. And the 51 have to do with decisions like whether to provide a loan to a certain country if it has balance of payments difficulties, and the 85 has to do with structural fundamental changes in the way the IMF is run. Now, there is one minor detail which most people will fail to mention to you, and that is that the US has 15.3%. If you do the math, that means if the US votes no on something, it will not go through if it's an 85% decision. If the rest of the world votes together, every single country except the US, it's still not enough to push changes through in the IMF. And this is what I mean by the democracy of quotas. This is how the fund operates. As essentially, it means that the US has veto power on fundamental decisions. Now, the next thing which is interesting, and this comes up only every five years when the leaders of the World Bank and the IMF have to be chosen, they are replaying a compromise that had been reached in 1946, and that compromise has reflected the relative powers of countries at that time, and that compromise basically says if the leader of the IMF has to be chosen, it must come from a European country. If the leader of the World Bank has to be chosen, it must come from the US. To hell with all the rest. Um, this remains the case to this day, and it is a subject of very intense criticism by a lot of people. Um, first of all, it's not obvious that the smartest leaders can come from only these places. Actually, this says that the best macroeconomists are always European and the best microeconomists are always US. Um, second, it really downplays the roles of developing countries. Now, let's look a little bit at the quotas, and I'll have two charts for you. But again, the quotas were determined, the share, relative quotas were determined in 1946. As a result, if you add up the quotas of Belgium and Netherlands, they are actually bigger than the quota of India. If you add up, I'll show you the charts. There, there are inequities which, which are glaring in today's world from this quota system. Um, now, in addition to having individual quotas, the decisions are really made in the executive board. The executive board consists of executive directors. Some countries have individual executive directors. There is a US director, there is a UK director, there is a Saudi Arabia director in the IMF uh, board of directors. 
for most countries, their share of the overall quota is not sufficient to delegate a single director. Therefore, they team up in groups, and those groups are called constituencies. And guess what? Those constituencies are almost invariably led by develop developed country directors. So there is a Dutch director who will have, I think, 14 different countries aligned with him. There is the Belgian director, again, another bunch of countries. And this constituency system reinforces the stranglehold that the developed countries have on decision making in the IMF. This is one part of the IMF I, I think most observers would say not optimal, except perhaps the developed country representatives would like it. Um, I'll come to some charts to, to show the issues that come up with these uh, quotas, but let me just make very clear. What I am saying is, is not what a number of people are saying, which is that these institutions just need to be abolished. Actually, that would be the wrong approach and the wrong response. Because there are such things as global public goods, and then I list some examples. Statistical information, for example. The IMF has done a lot to generate realistic, international comparable, and reasonably sound statistical information in all its member countries. I should mention that every single country is member of the IMF with the exception of North Korea and Cuba. So it really is a global institution. Um, the international financial system, actually the reason that the fund was created was to make sure that the international financial system functions. And this is a global public good. And with some exception, exceptions, the fund has done a reasonable job in, in actually delivering on, on this uh, task. Uh, there is another reason why you don't want to abolish the international financial institutions, and that is that global policy coordination is necessary. I mean, I've, I've talked about this before. Uh, it's very obvious that there are global issues that need to be addressed in a global way, and, and if, if you try to address it, optimizing at the single country level, it will just not be good enough. And global policy coordination must happen somewhere, and for better or worse, this is a forum where, where quite a bit of it happens right now. So if you were to abolish it, you would have to invent it again to, to actually deliver on, on this task. There are also externalities. Uh, one externality is glo on global demand. If, if several countries have a cyclical downturn, that will imply less import demand for other countries, and this has to be managed somehow. And, and for this, again, you would need a forum for discussing the policy response. There, there is the business environment, and, and of course, there is the environmental issues that I have talked about. So let's look at the democracy of quotas. As I said, the US has the, by far the largest quota among all member countries. This is just uh, in millions of SDRs. SDR is an artificial currency, which right now is at about 1.4 to the dollar. Uh, it's, it's just an accounting currency. Uh, all IMF loans are given in SDRs. They are repaid in SDRs. Uh, but the moment they are given, the country actually says, don't give me SDRs, give me so many dollars, so many UK pounds, and so many Swiss francs. Um, but all the accounting is done in SDRs, including the size of the quota. So the US has 37 billion SDRs in quota. That also means it has 37 units of votes. This actually adds up to, as I said, slightly above 15% of the total, which gives rise to this implicit uh, veto power. Japan, Germany, UK, France, I've added up the Benelux countries, Belgium, Netherlands, and Luxembourg. Guess what? The first developing country comes here, China. Benelux has more voting power in the IMF than China. So individually, US, Japan, Germany, UK, France also have more voting power in the IMF than China. Then here I've added up the four largest economies in the former Soviet Union. 
Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan. They are about, in total, in terms of voting power, about the same as China. And again, falling short, in total, to all these countries before. India is, slow, is smaller than Saudi Arabia, for, which has to do with global politics. Uh, I, I added up Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, all the five stands here. Sorry. They barely show up. And those are, some of them are really big countries. Um, Armenia plus Georgia is this. Let me remind you. This is about Belgium. Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan together would be this much. So this is the democracy of quotas. And let me just do one more exercise, and that is to show you one citizen from each of these countries, how much voting power they have in the IMF. One citizen in Benelux countries has this much voting power. This is again measured in SDRs. It doesn't really matter. It's the same unit across. Saudi Arabia, this much. Actually, the US is here. China, India, here. Now, this is a somewhat unfair thing to do because the voting, the quotas, in part, depend on the number of citizens, on the, number, on the population. But they depend on a bunch of other things. Measured GDP, volatility of uh, external trade, and so on. But the implication is very clear. It's a democracy which has its flaws. Now, um, I'd like to just spend one more slide on, on uh, how the UN system and UNDP in particular could come into this, this whole picture. It's very clear that donors have to coordinate, not only because that's a good thing, but also because you want to make the best use of scarce development dollars and also Governments are very thinly stretched. If they have to meet with every single specialized UN agency, it's the same minister who has to meet with the same advisors. And then that person has to meet again with the World Bank and then again with the specialized banks and then again with the IMF. It's just not realistic. The development agencies have to, have to coordinate more and cooperate more. UNDP in particular, has actually the official task of coordinating the various UN agencies, the specialized agencies. Um, its primary area is social policy, governance, environmental, and other policy advice, both at the central and, and uh, local government level. The, the biggest contribution of UNDP is that it has a proven track record in actually implementing projects in remote regions in, with uh, disadvantaged groups. And, and this is a clear comparative advantage. It's something others don't really do or do much less. And, and the reason that UNDP must coordinate with IMF and World Bank and the other banks and vice versa, these have to seek coordination with the UNDP, is that those institutions, in particular the IMF, have macro policy in mind. But that macro policy will never work unless it gets traction at the micro level. And this kind of traction is what UNDP can deliver. This, what I mean by traction is that IMF people never go outside the capital. I can tell you I've been at the IMF for 18 years. I've been to many, many countries. And it was very rare that we, we went outside the capital. Because our main counterparts are the central bank and Ministry of Finance couple of other ministries. For the policies that are devised by an institution like this, for, for it to make sense, it actually has to be sensible not only in the capital, outside the capital. It has to address issues of disadvantaged population, parts of the population. And first of all, the IMF was not even designed to do this, and it's okay. But it has to coordinate and cooperate with the agency that can do this. And right now, this is not an area that is done uh, nearly as 
effectively as it should be. Uh, so let me stop here. It, many debates in our country, should we or shouldn't we accept more, you know, like aid or donors from mm -hmm. World Bank or whatever? I don't know, I don't feel really optimistic about this IFI. I mean, you um, should do something more. <laughs> um, this is a question that has come up in many people's minds. Um, obviously, these institutions have done a lot of good and some parts which have not been so good. Um, in part, the response would, their response would be that they are learning from it. And, and indeed, there, there are certain aspects which are quite visible, that they have done things in this crisis quite in a different way from what they have done in, in the Asian crisis, for example. In the Asian crisis, the IMF's approach was you have a crisis, you have incomes falling, you have a budget that is facing difficulties on the revenue side, so cut, cut, cut. And, and that fed into a downward spiral of lower demand and also a lower level of confidence. This has been a lesson that has been learned by the fund. In this crisis, you see phenomenal sizes of funding packages. Usually it's measured in terms of quota, again, by the way, I haven't mentioned that. Any member country usually can get the, the size of the loan to a member country is always a multiple of quota. And for the first 40 years of the existence of the fund, uh, the limit for standbys, for example, and also for more subsidized maximum. In this latest vintage of IMF standbys, Ukraine got, I think, 11 times quota. Um, Hungary got a huge amount also. And, and also, Mongolia has just received an IMF loan several times quota. So there is more money coming, and that's one of the lessons. First, I'd like to address a misconception. I did not say, and certainly did not want to imply, that the UNDP is in any way better than the other specialized agencies. Uh, certainly, the specialized agencies all have their focus, and, and the ones that I have met so far in various countries, I have many of them I was impressed with. Uh, there's a separate issue of whether this is the optimal way to organize all these things, and I would say no, but that's a separate issue. UNDP is no better than the other, it's just the biggest. And it does have a proven track record if you look at the actual implementation of projects in, in a great number of countries. Uh, yes, there have been evaluations of this, but in my mind the most important most important uh, indicator that this has, this has been reasonably good on average is the continued demand for this. So yes, I would say that UNDP, and that's just the, the agency I happen to know most about, and it's still not a whole lot because I'm relatively new to UNDP, but it, it does have a track record in, in addressing issues in Tajikistan that nobody else would want to address. It does have a track record. We are just convening a conference in Kazakhstan on the whole set of issues of water use, energy generation, irrigation, and an environment for the border areas in Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and uh, Kyrgyzstan. These are, these are things that matter a whole lot to certain regions or, or countries or regions or set of countries and nobody else was willing to take up. Another one is in Kyrgyzstan, the uranium tailing issue. Um, and, and we can talk a lot about that. So I do think that the UNDP has a track record. Does this mean that the others don't? Of course not. The US dollar was, uh, was tied up with uh, Gold. gold, gold price, but eventually in 1971 they stopped this policy. Correct me if I'm mistaken. Perfectly true. Yeah. Yes. And uh, what was the main reason uh, of this decision? That was a member country Thank of the you. IMF deciding. It wasn't the IMF deciding, and it had to do with the Vietnam War. It had to do with the financing of the Vietnam War. 
There were tremendous deficits in the US in those years. Those deficits had to be financed. Given that the dollar was the uh, key currency in the world economy then, it probably still is, uh, certainly to a lesser extent. The US chose to finance those deficits by taking pieces of paper, printing dollars on them, and just giving it to the rest of the world. Now, this was a brilliant idea from the US's point of view, less brilliant from other people's point of view. Why would they take colored pieces of paper and then treat it as, as, as equally valuable? They tested this. They just said, OK, fine, give me the dollars, and then I'll come back to you. I want your gold. Here's 35 of those dollars. Give me an ounce of gold. Here's 35 million. Give me a million ounce of gold. And very quickly, US saw that it was on a path to run out of gold. This was the mechanics of why the US has decided Nixon has signed an executive order to, to stop the dollars exchange into gold at 35 to an ounce. So this was how it worked. Does this answer your question? So it was not the IMF as, as an international organization taking this decision. So let me stop here. Thanks very much.